Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome into the studio and welcome to this here video series where we will be making this. This is my version, a sculpted version of Saturn or Cronus devouring his child. I got the inspiration to depict this as a sculpture by watching Nerd Rider's video about Goya's Saturn devouring his son, which you can see here, which is quite the horrifying piece of art. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but first let's start off where we always start off when making a new sculpture, and that is by making the armature. The armature is, as always, extremely straightforward. It's just plumber's piping to support the seated figure or, or semi-seated figure and aluminum armature wire to support the clay itself. To hold the armature to the plumber's piping, I use a hose clamp. Hose clamps, together with zip ties, are kind of the secret super trick of armature making. I use zip ties when there is little to no space inside my sculpture and hose clamp when I have room inside my sculpture to cover the bulkier hose clamp with clay. Hose clamps are a lot stronger, so I prefer those, and they're easier to adjust should they come loose as well. Which actually did happen here. The figure wobbles quite a bit for a while in this video until I end up retightening the hose clamp. The armature doesn't need to have any correlation with the proportions of your figure. Actually, it's better if you not limit yourself like this and, and make an armature that has the opportunity to raise or lower the shoulders, for example. By having the armature section representing the torso be shorter than what it needs to be and the arms be a little longer than what they need to be, you'll, you'll achieve this. A flexible armature. Of course, I'm somewhat l more limited here than what I would be if I was making a standing figure because the armature comes in contact with the plumber's piping where the figure is going to sit. But also keeping it this way means that it's, things are a little bit simpler. I know kind of where the butt of my figure will end up being. For my maquettes and this figure, I'm not using any canons of proportions or any measuring at all actually while, while making this. I'm just shooting from the hip. It's a maquette and the proportions I'll work out when I make the larger version with the model. And that reminds me, I should probably mention that there's no model here, modeling formal. I'm just using Goya's painting as a starting point and then I'm exploring in the clay from there. I do like to adjust the armature before I begin adding clay, just to represent what the pose is a little bit closer. It helps me kind of see where I'm going in a way, though I'm, I try not to be limited by it. Meaning I'm willing to change the armature and the pose if, if it needs to happen. I'll be using Chavant Le Beau Touche clay and I think it's, it's medium grey. It's pretty soft in the Tuscan summer heat, but I'll still be using my ceramic model heater to warm up the clay and make it softer. And you'll be able to see that. You can kind of see it in the background out of focus. There. And that just makes the work go a lot faster while I'm blocking it. And I'm using Chavant here because it's oil-based clay and oil-based clay doesn't dry out. And when I'm making small figures like this, thin figures, it really helps me that the clay is not drying out on me super fast. So oil-based clay is a great choice for, uh, for maquettes. I begin with a box. I always begin with a box. And then I cover up the armature about up to the neck or so, so I can draw my center line on there so that I know where I'm headed, where I want my center line to be going. And this kind of begins the process of solidifying the core of my sculpture. Then all the elements like legs, arms, and head, they come out of the solid core of the torso. But the core must be fairly solid and established before I can add those. And this kind of minimizes backtracking also. Mostly everything in this video will be at regular speed with a few exceptions. So you'll see how I apply clay and how I draw on my sculpture to figure out where the forms need to be and where I need to add my clay. Because it's all going to be from my imagination, this sculpture is going to be pretty rough. I probably could have spent more time when making this actually, but I made this sculpture on a very limited time budget, so I had to speed things up a little bit. And anyway, it's more about the idea, the composition and the design. It's about bringing a thought into the real world so I can evaluate it further and reiterate on my design. If you are subscribed to the channel, and I hope you are, if you are not, hit the red subscribe button. If you are subscribed, you might have seen my previous video, nine tips to make your sculpture better. And in this video here, you'll see me employ every tip that I mentioned in that video up to 
tip number six. Tip number seven was to begin unifying forms and I do not do this in this video. That'll be the next one. But everything else is done with the first six tips in mind. I don't have a model, so orienting my bony points is more me just moving the armature to represent the pose as best as I can to begin with, and you've seen me do that. I draw a straight center line that works with my two major bony masses, the pelvis and the ribcage, and I connect the center line to the back of my figure as well, so that the figure has a spine in the same place in the front and the back, which is obviously very important. I make sure the figure has equal widths on either side of the center line. This is a bit of a tricky pose for this because the sculptor's rib cage is twisted on top of his pelvis. So the front plane of the pelvis is not the same as the front plane of the rib cage. When this is the case, you need to make sure that when you work on the contours of the pelvis, you are standing directly in front of the pelvis, not off to one side. And when you work on the contours of the rib cage, you need to observe from the front plane of the rib cage. Usually I find the front plane of the rib cage by looking for my model's sternum, which is usually visible in the center of the upper half of the chest. Depending on your model's build, this might or might not be the case, but more than likely, unless he's really, really muscular, the bone of the sternum will be visible on the surface on the upper half of the chest. And the sternum has a fairly flat plane that you can orient yourself after. And better yet, because it's bone, it won't change based on the pose. The chest muscles, for example, will move and when the arms are pulled forward like they are here on this pose, this can throw you off, making finding the front plane difficult. And on women it's even harder, right? Because they have breasts and... You can never really rely on fleshy parts when it comes to orientedness. So just as I would never use, for example, the belly to orient the front of the pelvis, I would never use the chest muscles or the breast to orient the front of the ribcage. So use the sternum on the upper half of the chest to find the front plane of your ribcage. Okay, that about covers the technical jargon in this video. Now you have an idea of what's going on and why I'm doing what I'm doing while applying the clay. So while you continue to watch me sculpt this, well, hopefully continue anyway, I'll talk about the inspiration for this project a little bit. Goya and his black paintings, specifically the one of Saturn. So let's start off with Goya. Who was Goya? Francesco Goya was a Spanish painter who lived in the 17th and 1800s. He was a successful painter during his lifetime, working as a court painter for the Spanish crown. But as he got older, he withdrew from public life, keeping his work private. Now he was diagnosed with an illness, uh, a fever of some sort that left him deaf, and the political direction of Spain had left him feeling quite alienated. So from the late 1810s, he lived in near solitude in a farmhouse outside of Madrid. And the house was known as La Quinta del Sordo, excuse my Spanish, or in English, the house of the deaf man, because a man that was deaf used to live there. And, and Goya had also become almost deaf from his, his illness. So Goya in his old age was a troubled man, likely suffering from anxiety of old age and, and fear of going mad not feeling connected to his surroundings because of his illness and the fact that he was deaf. And his later works reflect this emotional state, and, and this is where the black paintings come in. The black paintings is a collection of 14 paintings which Goya painted on the walls of his house. Apparently, Saturn devouring his son was painted in the dining room, which seems both appropriate in a way and also extremely inappropriate at the same time. Now, these black paintings, they were never meant to be seen, or at least they weren't meant to be seen during Goya's life. So there are no titles given by the artists, and all the titles have been awarded by art historians after Goya's death. Now, before I go any further, I want to do like a little disclaimer here. This channel is not only going to be about, and hasn't only been about, the technical aspect of sculpture. It's also an outlet for me to explore ideas that I have. Now, making videos, gives me not only the impetus to write on the techniques and method I use, which has solidified and clarified a lot of them and made my the language that I use to explain them a lot clearer, which has made me, I think at least, a better teacher of sculpture. But it also gives me the impetus to explore the ideas and concepts behind my work more in-depth 
than I used to before. Because I write scripts for these videos, writing kind of serves as a, as a place for me to make any thought clearer. The more I write about something, the deeper I, I get within my own mind and the clearer everything gets. So with this in mind, know that I've just started this project out and that I only have kind of a vague vision at the moment of what this is and what I want this to be about. And through working for months and months, or perhaps years, on the eventual over life-sized version of this sculpture, will undoubtedly help me reach new depths of knowledge previously unknown to me. So if you're after sculptural techniques and methods, you'll find that here. But you'll also find and be privy to a deep dive into my thoughts on the matters which drives me to create. So with the story of Goya as a backdrop, I understand that one would start questioning my motives for wishing to recreate or reimagine one of these paintings. After all, the story that I just told, it's pretty grim stuff. My motive to create this is more directly linked to the Greek myth of Cronus and what the myth tells us about ourselves. Saturn is the Roman version of the Greek Titan Cronus, by the way. So just as Christmas is the Christian version of the pagan ritual of solstice, Saturn is the Roman version of Cronus. I guess appropriating some of the customs to whoever you conquer makes the transition a bit easier or something like that. The myth of the Titan Cronus is very interesting, both as a story and as a psychological phenomenon that we have to watch out for, kind of what the story warns us of. Cronus is a Titan and he envies his father's power. And with the help of his mother Gaia, Cronus castrates his father and takes his place as ruler. As ruler, Cronus learns that his fate is much the same as his father to be overthrown by one of his sons. And to avoid being overthrown by his son, Cronus eats all his children as soon as they are born. And he ends up eating three daughters and two sons. But you cannot deny fate and Cronus is eventually overthrown by his son Zeus. The story itself interests me less than what the story depicts. A ruler driven mad by the fear of losing his power to someone he is essentially supposed to teach. Cronus's role as a father, or my role as a teacher, is to give his children, or my students, the opportunity to supersede him. You should want your child to be better than yourself. You should help them become better than yourself. This is progress. And denying someone's potential by keeping them in the dark denies progress. By denying progress, the world goes into a stall. And, and this is a grave crime. And the person who commits such crimes will himself be driven mad by his lust for power and the anxiety of losing it. So at the end of the day, this is not about cannibalism. The cannibalistic act depicted is just a vessel for telling a much deeper story, a story that we are all way more likely to succumb to than we are to succumb to cannibalism. This story is important to me, not because I've suffered from it, I have great parents, thank you for asking, but because I can feel myself every now and then slipping into the role of Cronus. If I'm not paying attention, it, it happens. When I lose my temper, it happens, for example. And I see it happening all around me. I'm surrounded by really, really talented artists whose job it is to teach others, but often enough I see slivers of the Cronus complex. And I'm, I'm not pointing fingers here. Everyone with an ego, and artists have egos, have to watch out for this. I see it in myself at times, and I find it, I find it terrifying. It's when you are not aware of it and awake that, that these parts of you come out, when you let these things come out of you. There is a duality in, in every human, light and shadow, and we have to accept that there is shadow so that we can control it. If we deny that, then it will undoubtedly overtake us. And so this piece will be a constant reminder to myself to not forget who I want to be and not to succumb to the darker part of myself. That's it for this week's video. We're not going to finish the sculpture, 
but I really thought it would be nice to do less time lapses and more real time footage so you can get more of a realistic feeling for the tempo of the work. Now let me know what you think about that in the comments below. I imagine that this will probably be three videos in total for the maquette and then potentially eventually another 10 parts or so over a really really long period of time for the over life sized sculpture that I plan to make of this. Which should be both exhilarating and horrifying. If you enjoyed the video and want to learn sculpture from me, check out my Patreon page. I give feedback and critiques on people's work and we talk about whatever you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, the link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share it with your friends and family. It really helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative and I hope to see you in the next one.